Hi, welcome back to our week nine lecture on infrastructure definition. How do we build infrastructure as code? Well, in order to do that, we need three different capabilities. We need a dynamic infrastructure platform. And this is a platform where that we can use to dynamically build and create infrastructure components. We need some sort of infrastructure definition tool the infrastructure definition tool uses the code that we write to describe how to build these components in a dynamic infrastructure platform. And then finally, we need some sort of configuration management tool. The configuration management tool manages the configuration of some of our infrastructure components, things like our EC2 instances which have operating system configuration and application configuration. We need some way to manage that configuration over time as well. Let's take a look at each one of these. First, we have dynamic infrastructure platforms. Again, this the, the idea behind a dynamic infrastructure platform is that it's this, this, this system that allows us to create compute and storage and networking infrastructure using program, uh, programmatic methods, using some sort of API, uh, using you know, some sort of scripting. Infrastructure, dynamic infrastructure platforms include things like AWS, which we're using in this course, Microsoft Azure, Google Compute Engine, which are competing offerings. There are on-premise software platforms like OpenStack and VMware vCloud, which also qualify as dynamic infrastructure platforms. And the, again, the key requirement to this, this infrastructure platform is that we have an access to some sort of application programming interface, some sort of API that we can use to programmatically create all of the resources. And this dynamic infrastructure platform has to be on demand. We should be able to create and destroy resources at will. We shouldn't have to have to like create a support ticket or or make some sort of request to a provider to provision infrastructure for us. That's not a dynamic infrastructure platform. I know there's there's organizations in town that are running things like large OpenStack deployments or VMware deployments. And if you want, want to create infrastructure in those, then you've got to like create a, uh, a support ticket uh, and IT maintains a service catalog. And, and you've got to go through this process to request and provision infrastructure. Um, that's an anti-pattern. That represents a hand-cranked cloud. That's not infrastructure as code. That's not a dynamic infrastructure platform. The second component is an infrastructure definition tool. This is a tool that allows someone to, to specify how that infrastructure should be configured uh, on the, the infrastructure, on the dynamic infrastructure platform. The infrastructure definition tool leverages the API that is provided by that dynamic infrastructure platform. It leverages that API to generate the infrastructure resources. Examples of these sort of tools include AWS CloudFormation, which we'll talk about in this lecture. Another tool which is very popular called Terraform. Terraform is, is made by HashiCorp. And then there's also OpenStack Heat and a variety of other tools available in the marketplace. Some of the tools, uh, some of the characteristics of these infrastructure definition uh, tools include the fact that they're generally item potent, meaning that if you execute the same infrastructure definition script multiple times, you won't make any changes to your infrastructure. So you'll, you'll execute that infrastructure definition script 
and it might go out and create infrastructure for you. And if you were to execute it again without making any changes, then it essentially becomes a no-op. In other words, it, it won't do anything. It won't make any changes to your existing infrastructure because the script hasn't changed. Oftentimes, these infrastructure definition tools will perform pre and post checks. The, the tool will try to validate that the, the, the fact that certain starting conditions have been met before the tool tries to create new infrastructure. And then once the infrastructure has been created, it can run some post checks. And a post check might be might trigger something like an automated set of infrastructure tests. The infrastructure definition tools try to surface failures. It tries to make failures very visible. The idea is that if 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 the tool is going out and, and creating some infrastructure and it, it, is, it is unable to create some component for some reason, it's it's got to be able to notify you, you as the user as to you know what the fault was and what the failure was, and and then oftentimes the tool is able to to roll back the changes that it made to the infrastructure or, or the resources that it, it it created, and then finally infrastructure definition tools are generally parameterized, meaning that you can create infrastructure definition files, which are sort of generic, and you can apply them on multiple infrastructure projects. And, and because you can pass parameters into the, the, into the file or into the infrastructure definition tool, then you can, you can sort of customize the way the infrastructure is built in different environments. An example is, is that you might be using the same infrastructure definition file to build a test environment and a development environment and a production environment. But there, there might be subtle changes between those different environments. Maybe the, the EC2 instance sizes that you're using in the production environment are larger than the development environment. And you could, so you could define the EC2 instance size as a parameter, which is set when the infrastructure definition tool executes or runs and processes that infrastructure definition file. That allows you to use the same file to stand up multiple infrastructure environments, but make small changes in the way that each environment is configured. How do we use these infrastructure definition tools? A couple of different ways. You could uh, set up unintended execution of the infrastructure definition tool. That's uh, you know, so it's it's being triggered by a continuous integration pipeline. That's very common. You could you can use a configuration some sort of configuration definition file, JSON, YAML, DSL. The, the configuration is, is, is completely stored in the configuration definition file. It's not sort of embedded or hidden away in some sort of relational database. You know, like our, our traditional configuration management tools in IT were were built by companies that were you know they're they're building these tools for very large enterprises and so these enterprises would set up something called a configuration management database and and this configuration management database is like uh, you would access this database through the, through the tool and you wouldn't, you would never access the database directly. You, you know, you, you'd have to access the database through some sort of tool. And so, the database would hide all this this configuration information from you. The infrastructure definition tooling that I'm talking about and that we use, um, modern IT organization, uses infrastructure definition files that 
are treated the same way as our application source code. The configuration is very visible. It's very, very easy to find. It's not hidden away in some sort of database. And then finally, we, we, we store these infrastructure definition files in some sort of version control system like, like Git, a Git repository. We upload it and put it into our repository on GitHub. When we're creating these, these configuration definition files, there's two different ways that you, you commonly find in the marketplace to define infrastructure in configuration files. One way is to define infrastructure procedurally. And when you define infrastructure procedurally, you, you are essentially describing a step-by-step -step process that is required to build the, the infrastructure. In other words, it's, it's kind of like writing a procedural software program. Think of a shell script. A shell script is procedural. It, it executes a series of commands from the top of the file to the bottom of the file. And, you know, so the interpreter will run the first command, and then after the first command runs, then it'll run the second command and, and so on. That's, that's, that's a procedural process. The second way to define infrastructure and configuration files is to use a declarative approach. And with a declarative approach, what we're doing is we're defining what the infrastructure should look like. What, what we want our ultimate, you know, what, ultimately what we want the desired state of the infrastructure to be. We don't define how to get there. We don't define, we don't tell the tool the exact procedure and the step-by-step -step process to build that desired state. We let the tool figure out how to build it. And so it's, it's you know, so we have procedural and we have declarative. So here's an example. On the left-hand side, we have shell code, which is run procedurally, where we start from the top of the code and execute each line down to the bottom. And then on the right-hand side, side, we have declarative code. This code is code which is written in Puppet for Puppet Configuration Management System. Both sets of code are doing exactly the same thing. The shell code is, is describing how to go about creating a user and adding that user to the system in, into a, a specific group on the system. This declarative code does the exact same thing. But instead of telling the system exactly how to create this user, the puppet code is, is saying, hey, I, I want a user called Elmo, and I want to make sure it's, it's um, a member of this sysadmin group. And the, then it's the, the job of the tool to go and figure out how to add that user properly to a particular system. So that's the difference between procedural a procedural approach and a declarative approach in our configuration management files. Well, you might be asking, well, which is the better approach? And there's, there's like, like, you know, most other questions like that, um, the answer is it depends. There are really trade-offs with, with both approaches. And, what you'll find is that certain software vendors favor one approach over the other, and there, there are times when one of those approaches might make more sense.